The Education Secretary, Michael Gove, has said the national curriculum is too crowded and cluttered and too prescriptive. So what's going to change? On Queen's Speech Day, the government reiterated its commitment to providing more curriculum freedom to teachers as a central area of policy. But just how committed is the new government to letting go of what happens in the classroom? In this edition of Need to Know, I'll be looking at the coalition government's early signals on curriculum direction, and in particular looking at the implications of the decision to abandon the primary curriculum reforms that were already in the pipeline following the Rose Review commissioned by the last government. What will fill the gap left by Rose? Could it be the Cambridge Primary Review or will teachers be left to develop their own approach? Some believe the new freedoms over the curriculum will depend on how well a school is doing. As Michael Gove has indicated, there are some things he would expect underperforming schools to do, such as synthetic phonics. In one of my early meetings with, with Michael Gove, when he became education spokesman for the Conservative opposition, I, I, I put this to him and I said, isn't it, uh, isn't it a, a contradiction? that on the one hand you want to give us more freedom and on the other hand you're telling us what to do. And his answer was interesting. He said, well, if a school is doing well, then I'm not going to tell them what to do. They can, if, they, if they are producing the goods and they are getting good results at the end of the day and the children are doing well and they're happy and so on in the school, then, then that's fine. Let, we'll let the school do it their way. But if the school isn't doing well, then there will be more of a prescribed way of doing things. Here at Bentworth Primary, they were expecting to start implementing the rose-based curriculum changes. Now they're having to rethink. We were already thinking and working uh, around developing a, a, a whole curriculum review away from the national curriculum. We were very frustrated as a school. We've been very frustrated with individual subject teaching. So before the publication of the full review, we were working on uh, an approach that borrows a lot of the ideas and uh, looks at some more generic skills around inquiry, observation, recording, presentation that we feel are skills that match the needs of our children. Announcing the decision to shelve Rose, the school's minister Nick Gibb said any move away from traditional subjects like history and geography could have led to an unacceptable erosion of standards in primary schools. Instead, the curriculum needed to ensure children had a grasp of the basics and a good grounding in general knowledge, free from unnecessary prescription. The curriculum should be a minimum national entitlement, organised around subject disciplines. Not all welcome this. If we're moving away from areas of learning and back to specific subjects, I feel like that's a retrograde step because the easiest way and the most important way to engage children is through their natural capacity and uh, potential to learn. I don't think children will uh, or do automatically learn in a set number of subjects. One group hoping to influence plans for the new primary curriculum is based in Cambridge and led by Professor Robin Alexander. The Cambridge Primary Review, which was largely ignored by the last government, is now organising a nationwide campaign to promote its ideas to teachers. So could you just clarify for teachers what exactly they should be doing now on the new curriculum after the election? The new government has come in and has confirmed uh, that the Rose proposals will not now go ahead. And uh, Nick Gibb has instructed schools to carry on with the existing national curriculum, that's the one that was introduced in 2000 until 2011-12, and then wait to hear what happens next. So is the current vacuum over the curriculum, if you like, is that an opportunity now for teachers and schools to almost reach beyond government and go directly to things like your review or, or other ideas? The number of heads who said to us, we really like the ideas in this report, we want to take them forward. But f at the moment, many of us fear to do so because we feel that we can't do so without permission from our Ofsted inspections and local authority school improvement partners. And uh, that's a pretty appalling comment, in fact, on the culture that's developed over the last 13 or 14 years, that leading professionals fear to innovate. The government is expected to appoint a committee of experts to advise it on the curriculum, but it plans to abolish the Qualifications and Curriculum Development Authority, 
so implementation of the new curriculum is likely to be done within the Department for Education. The real danger is that a professional body like the QCDA gets replaced by a curriculum that's developed by civil servants, government ministers in Whitehall. What we think the government should be looking at now is a minimum entitlement curriculum, but then freeing up teachers to look at the curriculum outside that in their schools to develop teacher initiative, to develop, to follow the interests of the children that they're teaching, to get, to get back to the sense that teachers are professionals. Without the QCDA and the national strategies which the last government decided would end next year, schools may find themselves much more on their own in curriculum development. Do you think teachers are actually ready for the new professional autonomy, the freedom the government is talking about? Are they ready to actually innovate and design their own curriculum? A, a significant proportion of the teaching profession now has known nothing other than the national curriculum or a national curriculum. And an increasing proportion has known nothing other than being told how to teach, the national strategies. So there is an, a, a generation of younger teachers who are familiar only with teaching to other people's recipes and requirements and prescriptions. And how that generation will handle the new freedoms is a fairly open question, I think. Those people will now have to get into a frame of mind where they themselves will be able to do some curriculum development as people of my age were able to do early in our career. And it's an exciting prospect. It's much nicer than just delivering, I hate that word, just delivering a, uh, a curriculum that's been designed by somebody else. Of course, the elephant in the room in any discussion of the primary curriculum is what will happen to the National Curriculum Tests, or SATs, at Key Stage 2. Ministers want them to stay, although they've said they're open to review. They also want to add a new reading test for pupils after two years at school. It was one of the most striking pieces of evidence in our review that the Key Stage 2 tests have severely compromised the scope and quality of the curriculum, particularly in years 5 and 6. Now we don't want that happening uh, in Key Stage 1 as well. Now primary schools have to accept that they must be held to account. There are clear dangers in any institution being held to account for a measure that is made by the people who work in that institution themselves. And so an element, a strong element, of external uh, um, input into whatever judgments it is uh, seem to me to be uh, inevitably part of, the, part of the primary school accountability in the long term. More detail on changes to the curriculum and assessment is expected from the government soon. Next week on Need to Know, we'll be focusing on the new government's plans for the secondary curriculum. In particular, we'll be looking at plans to extend the international GCSE to state schools and asking what the future holds for diplomas. Music